Hello, and welcome to today's NPS TEL course, The Basics in Iron Fencing Care. My name is Jason Church. I'll be your instructor. I'm a materials conservator with the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. Before we get started, if you'd like to turn to page three of your participants guide, we'll go over the objectives of today's course. After this workshop, learners should be familiar with the identification of differences between cast iron and wrought iron, the elements for doing documentation of historic iron fencing, original construction techniques that were used in the historic iron fencing, and in addition, learners will be able to reset fences with few complications, stabilize corroded iron surfaces, and also apply surface treatments to iron fences. Now before we get started with our workshop, our TEL course, I'd like to introduce you to the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. And the per best person to do that is our Executive Director, Kurt Cordell. Hello, my name is Kurt Cordell, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Park Service's National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. The National Center protects America's historic legacy by equipping professionals in the field of preservation with progressive technology-based research and training. NCPTT conducts in-depth research about current preservation issues at its laboratories in the historic Lee H. Nelson Hall in Natchitoches, Louisiana. The center's research, including research developed across the country through our grants program, is available at no cost to our users. Many of America's most treasured cultural resources have benefited from NCPTT's research, including the Statue of Liberty, Congressional Cemetery, and a number of national parks. NCPTT's training courses show participants the most advanced preservation practices through hands-on use of the latest technologies in real-world settings. Respected professionals in the fields of archaeology, architecture, materials research, and historic landscapes develop and instruct our courses, ensuring a training experience that is comprehensive and relevant. Our training programs focus not just on the how of preservation, but the why as well. We enable participants to return to their jobs with a holistic perspective and a thorough knowledge of the tools at their disposal. You can learn more about the Center's training and research products through our website at www.ncptt.nps.gov. Our website brings the world of preservation technology to you anywhere there is internet access. You can download research reports and perform intuitive searches through our preservation portal, even in the field. So go online and check us out. Okay, well, let's start our TEL course today. And today we're going to talk about historic ironwork fencing. Now, but when we get started, we're going to talk about the differences between cast iron and wrought iron. And to start with, what is cast iron? Cast iron is an iron alloy containing at least 2% carbon. Now, there are two main kinds of cast iron. There's a white cast iron and a gray cast iron. Most of the historic iron fencing that you'll see is made out of a gray cast iron. If any elements are broken, you can easily discern the difference between the two by the color. Now, cast iron is heated to a fluid state and then poured into a mold. Originally, a pattern is made from your original object. For example, in our slide, we have our little widget shape. A mold is then made from this original by packing what's called green sand around the original shape. The original shape is then removed. And it leaves a negative impression. Then the molten cast iron is poured into this negative impression. What you see on the left hand side are two workers pouring the molten cast iron. And on the right, you see a mold that has a piece of iron cooling in it and the green sand is scorched around that. Once that's cooled, the sand will be removed and you'll have your original shape. Now, if you'll turn to page six of your participants guide, we'll look at some of the differences that make uh, identifying cast iron easy. And one of the main reasons is the type of mechanical fasteners that are used to, used to install cast iron fencing. Now cast iron will not have rivets or welding done to it. What it typically has is mechanical fasteners to hold it together. So what you see here in these photographs are bolts, nuts, screws. This is an easy way to identify a cast iron fence by the mechanical fasteners being used. Now that we've looked a little bit at cast iron, we want to change and look at a little bit of wrought iron. 
Now wrought iron is just that. It's iron that is wrought and hand worked. In doing this we sort of think of the the stereotypical the blacksmith forging out iron work and you get these long thin shapes. Uh, this lends itself to very organic uh, shapes such as the delicate flower uh, pattern in the lower right hand photograph. Another thing that we see a lot with wrought iron fences is a repeated geometric pattern. And this is where a pattern can be made and then repeated for the distance of a fence. If we we'll look at our next slide, and we can see in this slide here a repeated geometric pattern. And this is typical of a wrought iron fence. What we have is one simple shape that's been forged out and then it's made repeatedly and then fused together. And we'll look in the next uh, photo, uh, the next slide, we'll actually see the different types of mechanical fasteners and fasteners used with wrought iron. For example, we see the same fence there on that far left hand photograph and each of those patterns are riveted together and this can be done either with a cold rivet or a hot rivet. And the same type of uh, rivets are used in that center uh, upper photograph to attach the elements and the different rails together. Now in the center lower photograph we'll see what's called banding and this is actually a thin piece of metal that's heated and then bent around the, the wrought iron elements um, to attach them. Another type of fastener for wrought iron is what's called a lap joint or a uh, fusion joint, fuse joint and you'll see that in your right hand photograph and in this cross you'll see two pieces of metal have actually been heated and hammered together. Unfortunately this one wasn't done that well and you can still see the seam a little bit uh, around the, uh, the point where the cross meets. Now that we've talked a little bit about the difference between wrought iron and cast iron, we want to sort of recap that. Now wrought iron, like we've talked about, is a much heavier um, element, but these can also be more detailed. You might have cast cherubs on gates, you may have willow trees and lambs, uh, very detailed little scenes can be cast into uh, the fence panels. Wrought iron is also cheaper to make. Uh, this is mass produced at a manufacturing facility. The molds can be made over and over again. Uh, so this really leads itself to mechanization. Also, cast iron uses mechanical fasteners. And we saw that earlier. We saw the photographs of the rivets, uh, I, I'm sorry, of the bolts and the nuts and the screws holding that together. Um, Cast iron can also be held together in tension, and that's where you have the cast iron post. Then you bolt to those, you have rails, and then cast iron panels actually hung in tension on these rails. Now, on the opposite spectrum, we have wrought iron. Wrought iron is lighter and much more delicate. Wrought iron has simpler shapes, and it's also much more labor intensive. So, this makes it a much more expensive fence to manufacture. Uh, you need a lot of skilled craftsmen and even when mechanization came around and wrought iron fences were mechanized you still had a lot of skilled craftsmen to set machines up and to uh, install the fences. Also we have talked about the fastening techniques wrought iron is also typically riveted or fused together. Now that we've talked about the differences between cast iron and wrought iron we want to look at another thing that is mixed fences. A lot of fences that you'll typically see are actually mixed elements of the two. For example, the photograph we see on our left, we have a very simple wrought iron picket and wrought iron scroll. However, we have applied to that a cast iron finial and a cast iron corner post. On the photograph on the right, we then again have a very simple wrought iron picket and wrought iron rail, but a very thin, delicate cast iron element that's then applied to it as a finial. It's very important to notice the differences between the two the same procedures that work well with wrought iron will shatter and destroy cast iron. So it's very important to know which elements are made from which. Now a fourth type of fence that we'd like to talk about is what's called drawn wire. And this is actually wire that's drawn from a machine and either woven or twisted together uh, to form a pattern. Now drawn wire will work in the same characteristics that a wrought iron fence does. So now that we've talked about some of the differences if you follow along on page 7 of your participant guide, we'll look at documentation of historic fences. Now, one of the first things we've talked about is, of course, identifying the difference in cast and wrought. We also want to look for any manufacturer's labels, uh, more manufacturer stamping on the fences. We want to look at paint colors that are found on the fence, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We also want to 
do a current condition assessment of the fence as it is right now before any work begins. You want to know where the fence stands before you do the work. And also it's an ideal situation to do documentation during work, all the procedures and the treatments done on the fence, and also a condition assessment and documentation after the work has been completed. And it's also important at this time in documentation to note any missing features of the fence. This is very important later on if there's any theft or vandalism at your historic site or in your cemetery to note what you had to note if you, it's missing. Uh, it's a common occurrence that fence elements are stolen, but unfortunately if you didn't have a record of what you had, it's hard to replace the pieces or put them back in the context if they are reclaimed. Now condition survey forms are available, but you may need to make your own uh, for the project and this information that you're looking for. So we want to talk a little bit in detail with the documentation. One of the first things we talked about was the labels. And the photograph on your top left that you see, this is actually a bronze plate that's riveted onto a gate. This gives us the name of the company that made the fence and also the location of where the fence was made and shipped from. The photograph we see on the lower right hand side, the manufacturer actually cast the name of the company into the fence. Now this is very important to look for. There are a lot of period uh, catalogs available and historic documentation from these companies that we can look to see when the fence was made, how it was made, how it was constructed originally on site, and where trade routes and people were, were selling in the area that you're working. Another important aspect of documentation is the color of the fence. Now typically we think of a historic fence as being black or maybe even dark green. However, this was not always the case. Uh, particularly during the Victorian era, fences may come in a variety of colors. In the photograph here we see a teal color fence on the left hand side and this may have been period um, historically accurate for the Victorian period say in Florida. This fence is in Pensacola, Florida. On the right hand side we see a black fence from a national cemetery. However, if you'll notice all of the, the decorative elements of this fence were gilded. The shield, the finials, uh, that's usually not the case when we think of it now. We don't think of these bright gilded elements. Now that we've talked a little bit about gilding, we also want to look at, be careful to look at fences to see if there are any plating remains. A lot of fences had uh, galvanized plating. They may have had bronze plating, uh, gilding. Uh, so look for that. And you want to look for paint elements in areas where the fence has been bolted together. Uh, if it's become unbolted, there may be uh, remnants of paint left between. Also look at very thin elements and underneath panels to see if any of the original f uh, paint remains and that's something you would want to document. Also before any conservation work or surface treatments take place you want to notice and take any photographs if possible if there are any mixed metals on your fence. For example if we look at the next slide you'll see a photograph on the left of a fence that has bronze finials and bronze mask applied to it. Once the surface coating has been done and the entire fence has been painted, it will be very difficult for us to see that these were bronze elements. Also, the photograph that we see on the right has cast lead elements. Uh, now, this was a common thing. Uh, lead elements could be, be made very cheaply and very easily. So a lot of your more decorative elements on a fence may be made out of cast lead. Also, a lot of historically accurate uh, repairs were done in period with cast lead. So that's something you'd want to look for before painting a fence. You'd want to photograph that and note that. So at this time, before we move on to any of the conservation techniques, I'd like to open uh, up for discussion any questions. If any of you have questions about documentation, about um, fence types, uh, please feel free, especially uh, if you have questions about fence color or manufacturer, uh, feel free at this time to use your push-to-talk mic, uh, ask me questions. And also, if you just want to tell us uh, if you have any unusual fences or unusual uh, colors, possibly, on your historic site. So, feel free. Hello? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Teal and black for colors. What were some other colors during the historic period that we might find? Sure. Um, in a lot of period catalogs, unfortunately, what we see primarily now are the black colors. 
Um, but in historic catalogs and photographs in the time, uh, white was a common color. I've seen a variety of blues and greens used, and also a lot of plating. And unfortunately, the plating doesn't really hold up, or it gets painted over and it's lost. Um, but a lot of bronze plating in either a bright finish or a dull finish. I've seen uh, what's considered pewter plating, or a also a galvanized plating that turns the fence a very uh, sort of buff silver color. Uh, all of these um, are, were historically accurate and show up in period literature uh, from the turn of the century. And also, of course, a lot of um, multicolors. Uh, for example, seeing fences that were black but had green decorations painted on it, uh, as well as gilding and maybe even a little blue lettering uh, around uh, the finials, that sort of thing. So I hope that answers some of your question. Uh, any others? I just got one question passed to me. The question is, my fence is red. Is that an original color? Uh, more than likely not. Uh, red is a color, particularly in at a battlefield or a cemetery, that you wouldn't really see. Now, it would be possible um, possibly to see it around a historic house or in a garden, uh, but red's not a typical color we think of with a historic fence. If your fence is showing a red color, it's more than likely a red oxide primer that was applied to it underneath the finished coat that is showing through as the finished coat wears away. So if you see a lot of red elements to your fence, more than likely that wasn't its original surface color, that was uh, remnants of a red oxide primer. And if, the paint, if it was, your fence was painted at a much more recent time, 40s, 50s, you may also have some elements of orange also from uh, common primers of the time period. Um, any other questions? Okay, if there's no further question this time, I'd like to move on to conservation of your historic iron fences. Now the first thing we want to look at is how to reset and level your fence. And then we're going to talk about replacement and repair of damaged or missing fasteners. And we're going to go through some simple repairs for breaks and bends in the fence. And then we're going to follow up by cleaning the rust from the fence and then cleaning the fence in general. And then we're going to talk a little bit about chemical treatments, uh, and today in particular, rust converter. And also, then finally, wrapping up with uh, primer and paint. So the first priority that we want to talk about in conservation, and if we can move on to the next slide, thank you, is that all adjacent materials must be covered before any work can begin. Now a lot of the procedures we'll do to the iron fence, and a lot of the treatments, the chemicals and the paints, will permanently mar and stain the surrounding area. So this is really important to cover any walkways, to cover uh, headstones, to cover the house itself that it may be connected to, the floor of the balcony, that sort of thing. That's very important. It's also really important to cover up any ornamental plantings or any fragile plants that are in the area. Uh, it's very typical in gardens and cemeteries and along walkways to have ornamental plantings planted right up alongside the fence. So it's really important to cover those, maybe with netting. Uh, this may be a good time to consult a historic landscape expert or just a landscape expert in the area to find out the best way to cover up ornamental plantings. And also, now that we're talking a little bit about plantings, we want to talk about how to remove any potentially harmful plants. And that would be to start by cutting back vines that are attached to the fence, to remove stump sprouts, and what that is those are the sprouts growing up from a stump of a bush or a tree that's already been removed in the past and has hopefully uh, been removed to, to remove and destroy the plant. So you want to go ahead and remove any of those stump sprouts. You want to cut or tie back any overhanging branches. And this is really important before doing a lot of work to a fence uh, to look high overhead and make sure there's no dead or overhanging branches that may fall in a week, a year, but um, damage the fence that you've worked so hard to restore. It's also important this time to remove any small uh, invasive trees or shrubs that are growing up through or around the fence or small trees that you know will grow bigger in the future and do damage to the fence. Now this is also a good time to consult a local historian, a landscape expert, um, to look at 
to make sure that you're not removing any heirloom plants or any plants that may have uh, historical value to the site or to the area that you're working. We've talked a little bit about removing saplings and small plants and shrubs that may cause damage in the future. Well, once that's already been damaged, how do you prevent any further damage? And we see in the photographs here, a lot of times trees are planted either by accident or on purpose, very close to fences, and if left unchecked, this is the kind of damage that you see. Now one thing to keep in mind is once the tree has captured the fence, this now belongs to the tree and we want to leave it alone. You're not going to benefit the fence or the tree any by trying to remove um, the elements. So you just want to leave those and you want to cut the outlying fence free of the tree. And this is going to prevent the tree from, from growing into the fence and capturing more of it and eventually pulling the entire section down with it. In the lower right-hand photograph, if you'll, if you'll see on the far right-hand side, you actually have a support post there. This would be a good example of when to remove the fence right from that support post, photograph it before, during, and photograph the elements that you remove after you've removed them. Tag them well to the area they go and put them in storage so this tree can then continue to grow without further damaging the fence any. Alright, so now that we've covered everything, uh, we've covered our plants, we've covered our walkway, our possible headstones. We want to look at reset and leveling the post. This is the next phase. And posts may be ground supported or set into stone or concrete. These posts may require excavation to move them at all. We'll look at that. Posts must be plumb and level to properly support fencing. If you want to turn to page 9 of your participant's guide, you can follow along with me on the different types of fence posts. So the first thing we will look at is ground supported fence posts. And if you look at the next slide, the photograph on your far left, that entire bell shape connected to that fence post is supposed to be completely um, submerged in the soil. And this will actually help stabilize the fence. Unfortunately what we have here is the ground around this fence has eroded so much uh, that it's not even in contact with the soil at all. It's uh, sadly sitting on a couple of small rocks. Unfortunately, once these rocks fail, the fence will begin to sag and it eventually will bend and the small cast iron elements that you see connecting the pickets to the rails more than likely will break because of this. If you look at the illustrations from period catalogs on your right, you'll see that a lot of the fence I've seen as much as four to six feet may be underneath the soil. Now to jack up the fence any, to move it, to level the fence post at all, it may be required to excavate a large area around these. So if you're working in a historic battlefield uh, near an archaeological site or in a historic cemetery, you may need a special permit to excavate to move the post. So that's something to keep in mind. In addition to being set into the ground, some fences are set into stone elements. For example, in the next slide we'll see that the corner posts are actually set into two foot long, six foot, I mean six inch square stone blocks. And unfortunately all of these blocks had uh, settled into the soil. Upon excavation we had to raise all these blocks. It's important to keep in mind that in a, the only part of a fence that should ever be in contact with the ground are the support brackets or the post. So this entire fence had to be raised if you do have fence panels and fence posts set into stone, these are usually set into lead. They could additionally be set into molten sulfur, and you'll know the difference. Uh, molten sulfur has a very yellow appearance, and of course it has that classic sulfur smell. These can easily be reset with molten, lo molten lead or also with uh, lead wool. When you're refilling these holes and resetting these elements, you always want to make sure that you overfill the hole. And if we'll look at the next slide, we'll see some examples of this. You want to overfill the hole, and it, this should help shed water away from the ironwork. And you want to make sure you don't leave any voids for water to sit in. For example, the photograph on the upper right, you'll see a small void in the lead work where water has been allowed to pool right against the ironwork, and it's already started to, to uh, rust and corrode, and you see the, iron, the red iron oxide uh, pooling out and staining the marble around. So you want to make sure that you don't leave any voids and that all of those uh, areas are filled. Now if you have fence posts that are set into masonry or concrete, 
pretty much the same principles apply. Uh, it's very important to reset with color matched mortar or to reset with uh, concrete that's on, of the same color. A good example of this is the lower right hand uh, photograph. You can see that a color matched um, mortar was used around this fence post that matches uh, the brick and the tile set into the balcony in this photograph. And just like with the lead that we talked about, you want to overfill that hole and slope it away from the iron. And this keeps uh, the moisture moving away from the iron at all times. Well, now that we've talked about resetting uh, fence posts, we want to look at replacing any damaged or miss, uh, missing hardware. And you want to replace with like styles and sizes. Um, if iron rivets were used, it's very easy to still get iron rivets. Um, these could be, if they're a thinner rivet, these can be hammered in cold. And if they're a larger one, they can, these can easily be hammered in hot. Also, iron and stainless steel bolts can be used. And if you'll follow along in your participant's guide on page 10, uh, there's a little bit more information about that. Uh, if you can't obtain iron bolts, stainless steel uh, bolts are always a very good substitute. Now, if you have failed hardware that's either rusted off or broken into the elements, those, these will be, need to be drilled out. Uh, once they've been drilled out, it's very easy to tap cast iron and wrought iron. You can re-tap the rusted holes or damaged holes with the same size and the same thread count, or you may have to move up to the next size. Uh, this can easily be done and is a very simple repair. Um, now that we move on from that, we want to talk about some very simple repairs that we can do with wrought iron and cast iron. And the first thing we're going to look at is wrought iron. Wrought iron can, for the most part, easily be bent back into shape easy, either using uh, heat or done cold. Now it's very important if you have a thin element or an element that's been very deeply bent to check the point where it's been bent to make sure there are no tears or rips. Um, you want to be careful not to uh, do any more damage by moving the panel back or the element back. If you do have a very deep bend, let's say a car or a tree has fallen on the fence, uh, you may need to heat the fence before bending it. And this can be heated with a low oxyacetylene flame. Now this is an oxyacetylene torch, uh, but not a cutting torch. Uh, cutting torch is going to be too hot and could easily uh, cut through and damage the fence. A propane torch can also be used. This will be slower, but it's also a little bit safer to use uh, with your wrought iron elements. Any rips, breaks, or tears in the fence can also be welded back together with a torch or with an electric welder. And this is going to weld very similarly to uh, mild steel and uh, other types of iron. Uh, cast iron, however, is a little bit different. There's two main repair methods for cast iron. Uh, you have what's called cold repair, which is also referred to as stitching. And you have hot repair, which is uh, typically thought of as welding. And the first one that we're going to look at is that's the preferred method of cold repair or stitching. So if we look at the next slide, we can see an example of a fence panel that has been broken. In the lower right hand uh, photograph you can see that the panel has actually been drilled and very small stainless steel pins have been inserted. So one side of each of these elements has been tapped and the stainless steel thread uh, inserted and threaded into that and then the other side has been slightly over drilled and we'll use in a structural epoxy. Now there are a lot of adhesives available that can be used you just want to look at the manufacturer's recommendations to see if they are, uh, if they'll work well with iron elements. But there are a lot of structural epoxies uh, out there that do work well with this. The other method that's used for repairing uh, cast iron is welding. And this is something we don't generally uh, recommend for historical uh, material. Welding can only be done by a specialized professional with a knowledge of cast iron. Cast iron cannot be welded in the field. It has to be heated up in an oven uh, to a high temperature close to that of the welding and then brought down slowly over time. Uh, and keep in mind also welding can crack and weaken the iron. Now that we've talked a little bit about uh, some of the simpler repair methods, I want to open it up again before we talk about surface prep for any questions from the parks. If you have any repair questions you'd like to talk about, um, if you'd like to share some of the ways you've been doing repair work, uh, feel free. And also any of the questions you may have thought about, about some of the things we talked about earlier in the program. 
So I'd like to open it uh, once again if there's any parks out there that would like to ask any questions. I was wondering, are there ways to tell if a lot without a fence historically had a fence? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Actually, there are a few ways to tell. One would be to look in your local historical archives to see if there were any uh, photographs or documentation of the site. Uh, you may get lucky and see a photograph with a fence um, panel or a fence in the photograph. There may be also um, historical documentation that you see that may list uh, in public record or in the, the family's journal or something that a fence was purchased or installed around a house. Um, another way, of course, would be to do excavation. You may want to hire an archaeologist to look to see if there's any staining in the soil from either uh, where a wood fence may have been or where an iron fence may have been. Uh, there may be some staining or discoloration in the soil, uh, and a professional archaeologist uh, could probably be hired. Uh, to look at that sort of question. Uh, any other questions? Oh, and I've received another question here. Uh, the question is, what do you do if your fence has been galvanized, plated, or plated? Uh, is it, are you able to do repairs? And the, for that, it's, you can do some repairs, but not a lot. Uh, Unfortunately, you can't do any heated repairs if your fence is currently galvanized or has had uh, a galvanized treatment at one time. And what a galvanized treatment is, it's actually coated with uh, zinc, either electroplate or hot uh, dipped. And this is historically accurate. Um, a lot of companies as early as the 1830s were selling galvanized fencing in America. So it's not just the modern chain link that we think of. And unfortunately, you cannot heat or weld galvanized in any way. Um, what it does is actually releases a zinc uh, gas and you have what's called galvanic poisoning. It's very, very dangerous. So unfortunately, you may need to call in a professional or you may just have to uh, uh, leave your fence as it is if it, if it is galvanized or has been galvanized and still has remnants of that. Uh, any other questions before we move on to surface prep? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on. Now the first thing we want to do in surface prep is to remove loose scale and rust from the surface. And this can be done with a fine wire brush by hand or with a power tool. And if you want to follow along in your participant guide on page 11, um, it'll have some more information about this. But if you'll see in the photograph on the right hand side, you'll see some examples of a very thin wire brush um, and these can be done easily and can be obtained easily. Um, what we don't want to use as far as a wire brush is a very heavy corded wire brush or a knotted wire brush. And these are available either as hand brushes or with use with power grinders and drills. You want to stay away from those. They're too, uh, too heavy and too hard for your historic ironwork. And sort of think of our surface as a series of peaks and valleys. And what happens with these peaks and valleys when using a really heavy corded wire brush, it actually bends our peaks over and sort of uh, encapsulates that valley. And once you're doing your work, your paint and your rust converter won't have a chance to get into that and it'll continue to rust in that little pocket that's been formed by the metal bending over. And years down the road, you'll actually get corrosion from the inside of your fence underneath your paint because of that. Sandblasting is also not recommended. This is a little harsh and does remove a lot of the surface material and you could thin any very um, delicate elements and remove any remnants of uh, the original surface treatments. And you also never want to grind metal as a surface treatment. Uh, this may be necessary when doing any sort of small repair but uh, as a surface treatment this is highly um, not recommended. So as we move on with surface treatment, once we've wire brushed our fence we want to look at washing the fence. Now it's important um, when you're wire brushing not to remove all of the rust and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But once the wire brushing has been done you want to wash the surface of the fence and this can be either done with a knot iron detergent 
or, and water, or an ionic detergent that's mixed with a solvent. For example, a conservator soap of Volpex, which is a non-ionic detergent, can be mixed with mineral spirits, and this will evaporate off of your fence after it's been washed. But a, an important reason to wash the fence is to remove any uh, tap fluid or oil that's been used in replacing that hardware. It's also important to remove all that loose rust that we've now stirred up from our wire brushing, and also uh, thin elements of uh, biological growth and also uh, spider webs and cocoons are usually found on fences and this will get all of that off and give you a good clean surface. Now once your fence has completely dried we want to move to our rust converter. Now our rust converter is a chemical treatment that stabilizes and chemically converts the iron oxide on the fence to a stable iron tannate or iron phosphate. And This is done with the rust converter um, it's very important if you look at the photograph you can see that the surface is a very even smooth and clean uh, appearance but however it is still rusted. It's very important not to remove all of the rust. If you have a gray surface or a shiny metal surface the rust converter won't work anymore. You have to have at least some oxide for the rust converter to stabilize onto. Now there are two main types of rust converter. There are those that are a tannic acid base and a phosphoric acid base. And when using any acid, uh, it's very important to always follow the manufacturer's recommendation, especially when it comes to safety. It's very important to always use the proper personal protective equipment when using this rust converter. And this may include uh, safety glasses, rubber gloves, or chemical gloves, a respirator, uh, but be careful with that and, and always follow the manufacturer's recommendation. Now a rust converter typically goes on white, but then dries to a flat black. Um, so that's a good way to know when your converter has stabilized and when it's set up is when you get that smooth flat black appearance over your entire surface. And be very careful when using any of the rust converters to keep in mind that this will permanently uh, stain any stone or masonry. So you want to make sure that you're careful with it and then everything in the area is covered up. Now once your rust converter has had time uh, to stabilize and to dry, then we want to move on to a primer for the surface. Now a lot of rust converters actually say that they work well as a stable primer, but I like to go one step further and this is going to cause uh, a more maintenance free surface in the future. I like to use an oil based primer that is specifically designed for exterior metal work. And this is important to apply one to two coats and especially to make sure you get underneath uh, any elements. A lot of times fences have channel uh, rails and a lot of water pools up underneath these or around the areas that bolt together. So it's very important to get a good coating of the primer in all of the areas. Now after your primer has dried you want to move on to your final surface prep. And that's going to be your finish coat. Two coats of an oil based primer should be used that is specifically designed for exterior metal work. Now keep in mind the paint color should match what was either original or at least historically accurate. And this goes back to what we talked about earlier, looking to see if there were any color remnants left. But also keep in mind if you're working in a historic uh, district or in a historic cemetery, there may be guidelines for the specific color that you can paint your fence. So keep that in mind when selecting uh, the shade or uh, the surface, the final prep, final surface treatment for your fence. Now we're going to go on and watch a short instructional video that we've prepared that sort of reinforces what we've talked about and gives you a visual idea uh, and some guidance to follow along uh, when doing some of the surface prep and simple repairs. Now after that we're going to come back hopefully with some more questions so start thinking about things you'd like to ask or questions that you have. I would really like to hear from you. Uh, it's very important to have that audience participation so you know that you get the most out of it. And there may be other people who have the same question that you do. Uh, so feel free to ask it. So now we're going to watch a short instructional video. Hello. In this video, we're going to discuss the basic procedures for preserving historic iron fencing. Two things to keep in mind are to first, do no harm to the artifact itself. And secondly, always exercise personal safety. The first step before beginning any restoration project is documentation. 
it is important to document the fence as you found it before any work begins. This may be done by filling out a survey form or just writing a narrative description of the fence's condition. It is also a good idea to take lots of before, during, and after pictures of the project. Keep in mind to take pictures of both the details and the overall area. One detail to keep in mind when documenting your fence is to look carefully on the ironwork for any remnants of the original or older paint. On a heavily weathered fence, these may be found underneath the rails or where parts connect. Generally, we think of fences as painted black, but historically a fence could have been painted a variety of colors, such as green, white, or even have a metallic plating. If any remnants of the older paint is left, this should be photographed and included in the documentation. This may also help you decide what color to paint the fence. While we are writing our documentation, let us discuss ways to distinguish between cast and wrought iron. Cast iron is made by heating iron to a fluid state and then pouring it into a mold. It is fabricated in sections that are then bolted together. Cast iron is heavier and cheaper to make. The molds allow for more intricate detail. However, wrought iron is iron drawn and works slowly with continual heat and pressure. Since it is shaped by forging, this allows for simpler, more delicate pieces and is lighter than cast iron. The pieces are put together with rivets or fused together. The fence that we will be working on this video is a wrought iron fence that has cast iron corner posts. Now that we have documented the project, the next step is to always cover up any objects in the area where the work will take place. It's particularly important to cover up any stone grave markers as well as any stone or masonry curbing that may be under the ironwork. Rust, chemicals, and the paint will all cause damage to the stone. Another important thing to check on the fence is that the bottoms of the iron panels are free from the ground. Only the corner posts and support brackets should be in direct contact with the soil. Any unnecessary ground contact will cause the iron to corrode. If the fence panels are in contact with the ground, they may need to be raised, or most likely the soil should be dug out from underneath them. Now that you've been paying particular attention to the fence, you may have noticed loose, disconnected, or broken connections. It is important to fix these so the fence will be properly supported. Tighten all loose bolts first. This may require the additional use of a lubricant. If any bolts are missing, these will need to be replaced at this time. You may want to remove one of the original bolts to match the size and style for the replacement. Iron bolts are the best replacement, but stainless steel may also be used. Occasionally, bolts are broken off or rusted in the brackets. These will need to be carefully drilled out and the holes re-tapped to its original size if possible. It is important to center punch the hole and use a drill bit smaller than the original hole. Okay, let's get started checking to see if the fence panels and posts are straight and level. If they are not, you may want to lift or lower the corner post. This is only important if the panels are so far out of alignment that they are not fitting together correctly. In some cases, posts may be set in stone or concrete. If the base of the post is too heavy or large to dig around, then it should be left alone. Otherwise, the base of the post will need to be exposed and lifted to the desired height. Gravel or dirt can be placed under the base to stabilize it at the needed level. The next order of your project is to check if any of the wrought iron parts are bent or damaged. If there are any bent elements on your fence, these can be easily straightened with little effort and the right tools. Now that we have addressed all of our structural issues, let's work towards stabilizing the iron. We want to remove only the loose powdery oxidation and any rust scale that is on the surface. Keep in mind that we are going to treat this fence with a rust converter, so some rust must remain. To do this, we are going to use a stainless steel fine wire brush. Heavily corded or twisted wire brushes are too aggressive for historic ironwork and can easily remove too much material. When selecting a wire brush, you want to choose a finer wire. The fine wire lasts longer and is more flexible to reach tough spots and corners. I do not recommend sandblasting since some of the fence's detail could be lost and the iron will get overcleaned. Once the surface has been wire brushed, 
you will need to remove all the loose rust and dirt. Washing the surface with a solvent or a non-ionic detergent that can be mixed with solvent will clean and prepare the surface for painting. This wash will also remove any oil left behind around the bolts. After the surface is completely dried of all moisture, we then treat it with a rust converter. Keep in mind this is a rust converter, not a rust inhibitor or rust dissolver, but a converter. A converter works by chemically changing the iron oxide into a more stable iron tannate or iron phosphate. Most commercially available rust converters are a phosphoric acid or tannic acid base. Some are even a combination of the two. The only word of warning if using a phosphoric acid base converter is that moisture, including high humidity, cannot come in contact with the surface until the treatment is completely cured. If affected by moisture, the surface will turn a chalky white and must be recleaned. Keep in mind that when using any chemical to follow the manufacturer's recommendations for safety and personal protective equipment. The rust converter must be brushed or sprayed on all surfaces of the iron, paying attention to coat any under surfaces and crevices. Use extreme caution if spraying the converter because any contact with stone will cause an irreversible black staining. Once all iron surfaces have been treated with the rust converter, it must have adequate time to cure before you can move forward with the restoration. Check the manufacturer's label for the curing time of the converter that you were using. Once your surface has dried and the converter has had time to properly cure, you can begin priming the fence. You want to choose an oil-based primer that is specifically designed for use with metal. Some primers have rust preventative additives. These are good, but not necessary, since you have already used a rust converter. One or two coats may be needed depending on the coverage. You want a nice, even coating that is free of any gaps. It is recommended that all primer and paint be applied by a brush to prevent overspraying and staining in the cemetery. Now that your primer has had time to dry, we can begin our top coat. The color that you choose to paint the fence is your own choice that may be affected by the fence's original color or colors commonly used when the fence was originally installed. You may need to consult local ordinances to see if there are any color restrictions in your cemetery. When choosing paint, you want an oil-based paint designed specifically for the use with metal. Two coats of paint are preferable to get a good, solid surface coating. Now that you've watched this video, hopefully you have all the basics you need to preserve your historic iron fence. One thing to keep in mind if your fence is heavily damaged or corroded is to consult a professional conservator. And always remember to exercise personal safety and to do no harm to the object itself. And good luck. Welcome back. Hopefully that helped, uh, that video helped reinforce some of the things that we've talked about. And hopefully it's also given you some time to think up some good questions uh, or comments or situations that you would like to talk about. So now I'm going to turn it over uh, to you, the audience at the parks, um, to see what kind of questions you'd like to ask. Where can you purchase converter? Ah, very good question. Um, in the last few years, actually, rust converter has become uh, more commonly used. And actually, most of your uh, large chain uh, hardware stores, like Lowe's and Home Depot, are starting to carry uh, rust converters, both uh, phosphoric and the ta tannic acid. Uh, both of these commonly carry, at least the larger ones, carry Rust-Oleum's rust converter. And that's actually a tannic acid base uh, rust converter. And also a lot of the chain stores are starting to carry uh, a product called OSFO. And that's a phosphoric acid based rust converter. And both of these are very good uh, ones uh, that are starting to be commercially available uh, in your local hardware store. Um, another way to get them is, of course, to look online at conservation um, supply houses um, and order them through there. 
Uh, any other questions? Oh, we've got a question that's just come in. If your grave or house historically had a fence and it's missing, what should you do now? Oh, this is a great question. Um, it's, it's sort of up to the owner or uh, the agency in charge to see if you want to try to replicate or duplicate this fence. And this is only important if you really have good documentation. If you're restoring a historic house and you're taking it back to a certain time period uh, to make sure that that fence existed in that time period. And also if you're restoring, uh, for example, a grave marker or a cemetery plot that had a fence, um, good documentation that it did in fact have the fence and exactly what kind of fence it is. Uh, you don't want to just see that it had a fence and then put any fence back. Uh, this should only be done, we don't want to try to falsify history in any way. If you're going to put a fence back, you want to put either the exact style or as absolute close to it as you can get. Uh, so that may require uh, either buying a new fence that's made to look like the old. For example, there's a corporation, Stewart Ironworks, that's been making the exact same fences since uh, before the turn of the century. Uh, if you had a fence possibly from them, you could still get the original uh, the, a fence that matches it. So it's important to try to match up exactly or absolutely as close to as possible uh, the original fence if you are going to replace it. Any other questions? Hi, this is Midwest Region. Hello. Um, if we're out in the field <laughs> and uh, we're trying to document these fences and we're trying to uh, determine an age or a time period. Is there a good source of information like a website or that you would recommend a publication of, or something for us to be able to use for that? Mm. That's a very good question and this is one I might have to get back to you on as far as a guide to help age. Um, a lot of period photographs are available and also a lot of period um, catalogs are available uh, from libraries uh, I have a personal collection that can be, you can look through to sort of see the, the style and the type of manufacturing for the fence to sort of date it that way. Um, another good way to do is of course to consult an architectural historian. Fences were very fashionable and they changed in style and a lot of times um, if for example a Greek revival was currently the fad for architectural you may have a fence that had the elements of a Greek revival uh, Victorian, that sort of, so they can give you, because of the style and the shapes of the, of the fence elements, it can give you sort of a, a rough ballpark as to the time period. Uh, but a, a good way is to see if it is labeled and then you can look up that manufacturer um, and look to find period catalogs to help uh, date it within just a few years. Uh, but as far as a database or um, a public record for that, I'm not aware of one at this time. Uh, but that, that is something that I think would definitely be very useful uh, to historians. But unfortunately, I don't know of one that exists uh, at this time. Any other questions? Hopefully that helped you a little bit. Another question just came in about photo documentation, what might be used to help with, with photo documenting your fence. And that is something I didn't talk much about. We talked a lot about um, writing down uh, elements that are missing and things like that, but I didn't talk much about photo documentation. Um, when doing photo documentation, it's really important to photograph the fence as a whole. And this shows um, how large the fence is, how, how many panels are in it, that sort of thing but also to get a good detail of, uh, of a section of the fence and the corner post and of course if any gate uh, or really decorative elements still exist. And one good thing that I've found that you can use is a seamstress's board. And this is a board that can be used and it's gridded off. It's a fairly stiff board so one person can hold it up while one person photographs. And this gives you a really good sense of the size and scale without having to hold up a lot of uh, tapes or to write down a lot of measurements of your panels. Um, so that's one good option is to hold up behind your panel a seamstress board. Uh, any other questions?
Well, if there are no more questions at this time, I'll flash up my contact information. And feel free to contact me later, send me an email. If you do, I'm always welcome photographs. Um, I'd, I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can with a question. And if I don't have an answer, I'm very happy to pass it along to uh, professional conservators and historians who may have an answer for you. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like to, uh, to talk up in this situation, so I get a lot of uh, questions usually right afterwards. So uh, feel free uh, to consult with me, to ask me a question. I'd love to hear from you and see what kind of situation you have, what kind of issues you might have, uh, and be of any help that I can. Now that we've uh, gone over that and we don't have any more questions, we'll talk a little bit about how to get course credit for today. And this is really important. You've taken the time uh, to sit in. You want to make sure you get your course credit. Uh, it's important to take your online evaluation at the website listed. And you're going to click on the DOI Learn tab and go under the link for this class, which is the basics for iron fencing care. And you need to complete the evaluations within two weeks of the course. So that's by February the 1st uh, to get credit for the class. And also, uh, this is the first time we've done it. Um, yesterday, we, uh, NCPTT, uh, myself and Mary Striegel did one on essentials for cemetery monument care and we really appreciate these evaluations. We're new to the TEL system, we're new to this type of course. Uh, we'd like to offer more in the future so we're always uh, eager to get those evaluations uh, and comments that you might have on how we can improve uh, the courses that we give and possibly even what kind of courses you would like to see in the future. Uh, so feel free to do that evaluation and to contact uh, me with any questions or comments and thank you very much for